KC or KA. These are the rate constants referring to species A. Constants. And the part of the discussion last class was actually to emphasize that these are not really constant, but they vary as a function of temperature. But that's a lowercase kc. And it's used, if, for example, let's take ka as an example, minus i is equal to kc and ca cd. Okay, so that's the rate constant over here. That's right. There's another K, capital K, which is the equilibrium constant. Again, it's not constant, it varies as a function of temperature, and that was part of the discussion the last class to show how it changes. But capital K C not the same as lowercase K, A, K, B, K, C. Let's take a look. The equilibrium constant is defined the system, for example, AA plus BB goes inverse CC plus BB. We saw that KC is defined as the equilibrium concentration of C D over A B, and each of them are raised to their respective stoichiometric powers. So this is one definition for KC. The other definition is that KC is equal to the forward rate constant over the reverse rate constant, where KA refers to this forward rate of the The capital K and lowercase k tend to drop. Yes. And the K there is with respect to the species A, correct? The rate constant. The rate constants are always with respect to their species. I mean in the equilibrium formula. In the equilibrium that's equal to yeah. the species A. It's also equal to KB of the K minus B. It's also equal to KC of the K minus B. and rate expressions are always with respect to the species. We seldom make a distinction on this point because in general we only work with the rate constant of, oh, sorry, the rate expression of the limiting species. So we don't tend to also write minus RB is equal to KB, CA, CB. But we could, there's no reason why we, we have to work with A as our species. And KB is not equal to KA. It's, there's a relationship between K, lowercase a, uh, lowercase k a and lowercase k b. There's a relationship through the stoichiometric coefficients. Are the k a and k b negative a not equal? No, not. The forward rate is very different to the reverse rate. Reactions which proceed primarily in the forward direction. Um, and very little reverse direction, then you have very little rate constants in the respective directions. Okay. Is that statement like always true, like KA does not equal to KB, or sometimes could equal to each other? Right? They could equal to each other, so this is in general. There's specific cases where those stoichiometric coefficients might be, like, will, will be the same, then the rate constant will be the same. At equilibrium, the rate of reaction is equal to zero. So minus Ra is equal to zero. There's no concern with rate of reaction at the point of equilibrium. So knowing the rate expression really doesn't do you much if you're considering what's happening at equilibrium. Okay, so these are some important, uh, some important things that the group of you that are in tomorrow's tutorial will find useful. Mm -hmm. that the group today kind of tripped up a little bit on and discovered 
some of these issues that we're going to do. Some other things um, regarding the tutorial. Uh, please note that if you're looking for uh, tutorial <coughs> slot on Monday at 11.30 to 1.30 instead of 8.30 on Tuesday mornings, please feel free to come to the Monday tutorial. There's plenty of room. It's the only tutorial that I've had for the whole duration. The Tuesday tutorial I'm only at for a few minutes because I have another class to go to. So if you've got that gap free, please feel free to come. The other thing is I've noticed a lot of you don't come to the tutorial. That's quite okay. It's not, not a daycare. Um, what it is is a chance for you to get your questions answered. And for those that came to this morning's tutorial, they pretty much finished assignment two in, in the tutorial time. Um, most groups do. So it's definitely doable. It's a great way to actually get your assignment done, which incidentally for assignment two is posted and you are the Wednesday's class this week. So, Assignment 2 is made up mostly of the first of the second tutorial, which you've all covered already. There's a, two or three questions from this, today's tutorial, but it's the easy stuff actually that we covered in the last class. So it shouldn't take more than the tutorial time slot to actually write up your answers to, to assignment 2. Okay. Any questions on that? What does assignment 2 so I'm just posted this afternoon, but because it's primarily from last week's tutorial, which was posted Sunday a week ago, that's why it's due on this Wednesday. And the rest of the questions that were not posted are trivial, like they're plugging in what KC is. <laughs> There's no brains. <coughs> uh, so people will be taking that. Okay, so one other thing that's, that's useful for the tutorial is the following. We took a look in last class at the concept of designing reactors where we, where we look at the plot of flow from the rate. So we're plotting conversion against flow into the system of a RA. And for example, if we had a system which was defined by a slope as follows, we've used this example several times where we're looking to achieve a conversion of 80%. So one of the questions in the tutorial uh, today and tomorrow and for the assignment is asking to design the reactor volume for that system, the CSTR volume. So if you were looking at a single CSTR, to achieve 8% conversion, several times now we've considered that that volume is given to you by this area inside the rear region. So, volume for one CSTR. If we're looking at, as this question asks, what if we take two CSTRs and put them in series? So here's my first unit, there's FA0 and X0 coming in. Then I've got an intermediate stream here now, FA1, with conversion X1. And I'm putting that into a second reactor, also a CSTR this time. And I get flow out 2 and conversion X2. So this final conversion X2 is 80%. That's what we want to be at. We're asking what is the flow, uh, size of these reactors. So this is a reactor of V and this is a reactor of V. 1, V2, and specifically we write V1 to be equal to V2. The reason for that is when you go and buy a reactor from a company, it's easier to buy two of them. You'll probably get a discount as well for buying two instead of one. Plus, you're buying two smaller sized reactors rather than one bigger reactor. So cheaper savings over there, or cheaper cost over there. Okay. So what is the volume of one and volume of two, in other words, the volume of both of them that you have to buy? So here's the first question. If the volume for CSTR, let's say that was 6.4 meters cubed, is V1 equal to V2 equal to 3.2 meters cubed? Should 
Should they be bigger than 3.2 meters cubed? Yes? Smaller? They're both 2.2, you might as make one. No, but it's cheaper to buy two reactors that are smaller than one big reactor. Okay, so in the tutorial you see an example of that. The cost is proportional to the volume to the power of 0.53. Okay, so I'll teach you in 4N course how we derive that cost equation. We use tables and uh, <coughs> historical data. But that cost equation that's in tutorial 3 is volume to the power of 0.53 is related to the cost. So it's cheaper to buy smaller reactors than it is to buy one bigger reactor. The question is, what size should those smaller reactors be? Any guesses? Any? Okay, so we're still not sure if they're bigger or smaller, but let's, let's pose the question this way. Where is going to be the conversion leaving the first reactor and entering the second reactor? Okay, it's going to be between 0 and 0 0.8, that's clear. Is it going to be 0.4? More than 0.4. Less than 0.4. Okay, so here's our constraint. We want the two volumes to be identical. So, uh, I'm going to say that the first reactor uh, should be a higher conversion than the second reactor. So, just so basically, the thing is that the first reactor should be closer, closer to 1.8. Yeah. Okay, so the first reactor is here. We've got some, some people nodding their heads. The volume of that first reactor is here equal to, that's the area of E1. The volume of the second reactor is <coughs> B2. So as long as B1, that area of this green region, is equal to B2, the area of this region, we've met that constraint, and we've found the size of our two reactors. And can you see here geometrically why V1 and V2 are not going to be 3.2 meters cubed. Okay, so if that original area of red was 6.4 meters cubed, the sum of V1 and V2 is definitely not 6.4 meters cubed, it's definitely smaller. So you're saving two ways. You're buying a smaller unit that's going to cost you less money. You may get a break on the fact that you're buying two instead of one. And what's more is that the joint volume of these are going to be smaller than single size volume. So multiple savings. So then the next step is, well, why not stop there? Let's go to three reactors. Okay, what's going to happen with three reactors? So for this question here, um, so if you were to find like, what would be the exact conversion there, so how do you get that? How do you think we get it? <laughs> so the question is, how do you calculate the conversion of X, X1. Okay, so what is conversion on that plot? So you, yeah, just read it down. You just uh, it's geometric. So we're doing we're solving this geometrically. So we can read off this point of the graph wherever it lies. So we we've chosen that point over there. That's my decision point. I decide where to put that green dot. The moment I decide that green dot, it decides that volume and that volume. And it immediately cut, finds me what x1 is, it immediately finds me what the spatial is on the y axis. So how do you do it inversely? Visually. How do you decide where to put the dots? No? I do like the person. Okay, how do you decide where to put the dots? <laughs> visually. Purely you find it visually so that those two areas are identical. Yeah, but you're going to be very close. Your human eye is extremely good at measuring the area. <laughs> Especially when you're splitting it in half. It's not so good when you're splitting it in threes, okay, which is what the next one is. The next one's asking you to find the volume of three reactors. Same construction, same idea. So there's my original curve. Now instead, I'm going to three reactors. I'm going to have E1, E2, and then B3. 
Okay, so you can already see I haven't drawn these equally sized on the board. It's very hard to do in threes. But a little bit of trial and error, you'll get, you'll get what these uh, x1s and x2s are. And then the final x3 is going to be correct. Okay, so a question in the, in the assignment and the tutorial asks you to find the rates leaving the reactor 1 and the rate leaving reactor 2. For the three reactor system, it doesn't ask you to find these concentrations of the rates. But what you do need to find is those volumes, and then you can find the total capital cost. Um, for the cost equation, do you put for volume, is it the total volume of the CSTR or the volume of one? The volume per CSTR. That's the cost equation for a CSTR. Okay, so then you multiply by the number of CSTR. Because they're equal volume in this case. So the cost equation looks something like $2,800. That's the price of that reactor in 1970. Multiply by the volume divided by 100, raised to the power of 0.53. That refers to the fact that the bigger you go, the cheaper the price. So it's per exponent is a number lower than one. So the larger the reactor, the smaller the cost. Multiply by four. That's the cost of installing it, delivering it, shipping it, piping, wiring, uh, putting on the control loops, building the foundation, painting. So all of that multiplies the price by four times. And this is in 1970. If you want the price in 2011, you multiply by 149 over 300. Okay. So that's uh, where the formula comes from. I'll teach you all this in 4N. Yeah. Sorry, if you just said that the larger the volume, the cheaper it is, then earlier you said that it's cheaper for smaller. Yes. For a single, single CSTR. CSTR. Okay. Right, because if I have to buy one CSTR of 6.4 meters cubed, that's going to be a big number. But in a smaller number, that's now not half of it, smaller than half, right? So the cost is cheaper. So this is here's a general rule you can remember for CSTRs. In general, if I plot on my x-axis here a number of CSTRs, and here's one CSTR, two CSTRs, three CSTRs, four CSTRs in series, so number of CSTRs in series. The general rule that you can remember is that this plot looks something like this. One CSTR will cost you some amount of money, two CSTRs will cost you less, three will start costing you more, four, and it does something like this. It eventually becomes unprofitable to put smaller and smaller CSTRs in series. Initially it pays off. It might be that you need two in series or three in series. This minimum can be anywhere. This is a general plot. The minimum is not necessarily a two. It might be a three or it might be a four. It totally depends on the kinetics of the system and what this plot looks like. But in general, if you go from one CSTR, it's usually cheaper to go with two smaller ones. Okay? Not always, sometimes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I, I would for that specific question of course, if you do it and then you get a higher cost. Does that mean you did something wrong or is that no, it just means for the, the, the kinetics it doesn't work out. Okay, so that's, that's how you solve a uh, question, and that's pretty much the last question in assignment two. So now you're all set for assignment two. Yeah. Um, wouldn't it be easier just to make a conversion volume graph and then divide volume into three from the conversion point to one? So you're saying it would be easier to plot a conversion versus volume graph. So if, plot if we, have, if we have that data, obviously. So you plot volume on your x-axis and conversion on your y-axis. As we did like once recently. That's assuming that you get the same amount of conversion in every reactor, which for CSTRs you don't. In this first CSTR, let's say you're getting 50%, so you go from 0 to 0.5 in the first CSTR, and then you go from 0.5 to 0.8 in the second CSTR. So in general, with CSTRs in series, as I said earlier in the front, you'll get highest conversion in the first reactors and then lower and lower conversions in the subsequent. So it might not be a linear kind of thing. It definitely won't be. Yeah. So you could put, but it's not quite a linear, couldn't you just divide it and then you could go to the bottom? No. No, that, that plot works, no, you've got, the, you've got a great idea. It works awesomely for uh, PFRs, but it doesn't work for CSTRs. Because okay. CSTR, everything is well mixed and operating in one rate. Okay, so any questions on this? And on the tutorials, perhaps. So what I want to point out uh, for you now is just to give you a little bit of a look ahead of where we're going. Last class we looked at all those stoichiometric tables and they were pretty messy. But 
it's great to see in perspective why we're going to the complexity you're going to start to see in tonight's class. And the tables are going to get pretty messy, especially if you've got the handout in front of you. If you look at that second handout, it's just filled with messy numbers. So recognize the following. of temperature and conversion. We're going to end up with that. But realize the following. So far we've looked at very simple reactors, CSTRs, PFRs, and batch systems. How are you going to design a reactor, for example, where this happens? Here's my CSTR, here's my product, and now I bring a recycle stream back. Because I didn't get quite the conversion that I liked in the first step. Or well, what about a system as follows, where I split my feed into multiple reactors and then recombine it. So here's my feed, and then I put it into a CSTR, and then I have another CSTR, and I recombine it. This one's easy. We've actually done this one already. This is very straightforward. And this case happens a lot. This happens when a company has built a plant at one specific flow rate, and then the market share starts to go up and they suddenly need to produce more product. So they buy a second CSTR, different volume perhaps than the previous one, and they run it in parallel, just recombine it. So this is actually an easy case. But bear in mind that we could have that. We can also then start to play games along the lines where we take that feed and recycle it back around. So, here, we're so used to now, up to now, having A and B coming in here and C and D coming out. But that's going to change. We're going to immediately start when we have a recycle. We can actually have C, D, unreacted A and unreacted B coming around there. As a result of that, we've got A, B, C, and D coming into each of these reactors. You'll also see creative designs like this in companies where we've got our plug flow reactor and up to now we've just considered A coming in but I can have B have to do the following coming at multiple points along that reactor that's why in tutorial 2 we started to look at what's the profile of that reactor from the beginning to the end because we could have at at various points along the reactor, new feed coming in, fresh feed of B coming in. This is especially important when you get multiple reactions happening. That's another topic we're going to start to look at. We've so far just only considered one reaction, but what if there's two or three competing reactions trying to consume A? How do we handle that? And so this, this setup happens quite frequently. Um, some other things that you'll see happen are other setups as follows. where we've got A coming into my tank. And then here I've got C and E leaving to go to the next reactor. So systems along those lines. So right now, you, from this point onwards, you cannot assume anymore what's coming into your reactor is only your reagents, your raw materials. From now on, we're going to have to assume coming into my reactor is every possible combination of species that exists in the flow sheet, A, B, C, D, and inverts. So that's why in the flow reactor we designed or derived in the last class, very important here is that initially we've got Na0 moles of A, Nb0 moles of B, but we also have the number of moles of C as Nc0, Nd0. This was for a batch reactor we derived those equations. These Nc0, Nd0s are not 
zero always, numerically zero. There are the initial values of C and initial values of D coming into the reactor. And in the reactor that we're going to start designing, these terms, those values are going to be zero. So don't, don't set them equal to zero early on because they may not be. Okay, so just to uh, emphasize some of the points from last class, in the design of this table, so most of you have a copy of this table in front of you. If you don't, it's obviously straight from the textbook, as you can see, table 3.3. have a copy of it. Uh, we derived it in class actually last time, so you can just go back to your notes from the last class and add to it. But uh, I just wanted to emphasize the following points from last class. We defined greek letter delta which is equal to B over A plus C over A minus B over A minus 1. And we call that or interpreted as the expansion factor. So it's the change in the number of moles per mole of A reactive. phase systems. And we looked at a few examples where delta is non-zero in the last class. So for example, the water gas shift reaction where A, B, C, and D coefficients are all the same value, delta is equal to zero. So there's no change in the number of moles. The net number of moles stays the same before and afterwards. Let me emphasize that. So in a batch reactor, you have the system is closed. And for the water gas shift, let's just get that equation up here. It's embarrassing that I don't know it off the top of my head. But the reason why I don't want to mess it up is because I always get the sign the sides put to run. Okay, so it's carbon monoxide plus water goes to CO2 plus hydrogen. We just, we just flip that molecule from carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide and take, take it added in the water. So here the A, B, C, D coefficients are all the same. They're all equal to 1 and delta is equal to 0. That implies that in the system, this batch reactor, if I fill it with those gases, there's no change in the moles in that, in that system while the system is reacting. The number of moles on the left and the right hand side of that equation are the same, same to each other. Conversely, for ammonia production, we're taking hydrogen and, and nitrogen. Here, delta is a number smaller than zero. Which implies that the change in the number of moles Per mole of A reacted, if I set A to be hydrogen here, for example, it's clear that I've got four moles going to two moles. So the total number of moles in the system will reduce as that reaction proceeds. So that was that was a bit of back from last class. Some other things that were important was this derivation here in the table. You can add this in, in the table in front of you, there's the fifth column is a placeable concentration. So please, please note on your table in front of you, or in your notes if you don't have a copy of this, that this table here with columns 1, 2, 3, and 4 applies to any system under any conditions. There's no special assumptions in this derivation. Batch reactor, under any conditions. The fifth column of concentration, however, has a, has a special condition or assumption associated with it. If we derive the concentration Ca, we derived it in the class last time as Na0 over B0, 
and that's CA, CA naught times 1 minus x. This is assuming constant volume. So all of this that I'm going to write here assumes constant volume. We derive then that CB is equal to NA naught times NB naught over NA naught minus B over A times X divided by B naught. And that simplifies to CB is equal to CA naught times theta B minus B over AX. Okay, so this was this was in class last time and we said theta B is equal to NA naught over N B naught. Sorry. N B naught over N B naught. Okay, similarly we can derive that CC is equal to CC naught C A naught times theta C minus C over A times X. And finally the concentration of D is equal to C A naught theta D plus D over A. So you can add this to your table and then call five. The four concentrations C A naught, C B naught, C D, C C C D. And recognizing that theta b, theta c, theta d, these are all constants. So n b naught is a constant, n a naught is a constant, all the others are initial conditions, these are all constants. <coughs> so we actually, by doing this, we've achieved our goal of expressing the rate in terms of temperature and conversion. So we initially had minus Ra is K as a function of temperature, and then some complicated function of Ca, Cb, Cc, and Cd. So that function over there could have been, for example, a first order reaction, a second order reaction. We could have had multiple different powers of the A, B, C, and D species. But here, this table and these equations here re-express that rate constant now, the rate expression, in terms of a function of temperature and conversion, because each C J term is now a function only of conversion. So for example, C B is only a function of conversion X. All the other terms in here, lowercase b, a, theta b, c a b, these are all constants. So every CJ that appears in that function over there can be re-expressed in terms of conversion. And so we get this equation over here, which is our ultimate goal. So we'll give you uh, a minute or two to work through the following example. Let's write it up here. And you can try, try that for yourself using these concentrations.
So in terms of x, the conversion and other constants. But your only variable is going to be x. This is something that you have to be able to do very quickly because you're just basically setting up your problem in a midterm or in an assignment. This is simply setting up the problem <coughs> to do this step over here. So this is something you're going to have to get very, very comfortable with because the time to do this is really should be almost only a minute or two of the total time to do the question. So here you go for the net rate of reaction minus RA is going to be Ka CA CB minus K in the reverse direction CC squared for an elementary reaction. So we simply sub in right off this table that you've now expanded and sub in the corresponding value. So Ka, which may or may not be a function of temperature, if this is isothermal, it won't be, but if it's adiabatic, it will be. We'll get to that in the next class or classes. CA, the concentration of A then is CA naught times 1 minus X. Concentration of CB is written as CA naught times theta B minus B over A, which is 1 over 1 in this case, times the conversion X. Minus K mi, so minus A, the reverse rate constant. CC is expressed as CA naught squared times theta c minus the ratio of the stoichiometric coefficients 2 over 1 times x, the conversion all squared. So it's a, simply, a simple substitution. We can simplify that up a little bit, essentially. It's not, not going to take you too long. And you'll, you can easily see that in advance function of x up and other constants. So you sub that in then and you put that into MATLAB and you start to work with it in MATLAB, Excel, or Python, whatever you choose to use this. Great catch. It's not negative to over one, it's plus two over one. Thank you. Okay, and if you're looking for another example, if 
depending on which version of the textbook you have, uh, those examples up there will show you something similar. So if you know nothing about the reaction, you need to see it. Yeah, yeah. I would have stated it as an elementary reaction. But I, I didn't, I've omitted to state that. But uh, yeah, if you need to make an assumption, that it would be a safe start. Okay, so the next step then is to go to flow systems. That's what the second table is about. So for a flow system, we have the following. <laughs> system of the products. That can easily happen in many situations. We also have inerts flowing in, so they find not. And these flow in at a flow rate of Q. <coughs> Leaving the system is a flow of FA, FB, FC, FD. <coughs> the inerts also flow out at the same rate that they flow in. And I have an outlet flow of Q. The table is identical to the batch table, there's no difference, only make the following substitutions. Substitute <coughs> NJ0 for FJ0 and substitute NJ for FJ. And the other change you make is that your faders, for example, theta B now, is equal to FB naught over FA naught. So these thetas over here, the flow tables, are the ratio of the molar flows, whereas previously they were the ratio of the initial amounts added to the batch. column in the table in front of you asks us to express that outlet flow in terms of conversion. So what's the conversion of A and B and C and D leaving the system? So the con concentrations, CA for example, is equal to FA over Q, which is FA naught 1 minus x, so this I just read off the table, FA naught 1 minus x divided by Q. Similarly, CB is equal to FB over Q. So this relationship applies at the reactor outlet. So you've got a flow rate of Q leaving, a flow rate of B leaving, a flow rate of A leaving. So the, con the conditions I'm writing down here, and that you're transcribing into the fifth column of your table, is at the effluent from the reactor. Effluent from the reactor, this is currently a moles per unit time. We're looking at expressing that in concentration units. So here's previously we had 
moles per second divided by volumetric flow rate, which is expressed as meters cubed per second, it comes out to be a concentration. So these are the units. So FB then, according to the table, is FB naught. Let's just go over there. Over there. So it's FA naught. Constant density systems. So this is a big criteria, a big if. We're going to take this condition away in the next class. But for now, and to, to finish up assignment two, there's the one question that says, what happens if it's constant volume? Or in other words, this applies for liquid systems. no different to batch systems in terms of the derivation. The only thing is we're dealing with the volumetric flow and a molar flow and we take the ratio of those two to get the concentration. Now that's obviously for gas systems we can never make that assumption that the system is behaving at constant volume. But especially when we've got a reaction with the number of moles on the left and the right hand side of the, the rate of the equation different. Okay, so where we're going to head in the next class is deriving this mess of the table, which is super painful to deal with. If you didn't get a copy of this table, you would never write this out. I'm not going to derive this in class that you get to this level of detail. So what we're going to do in the class tomorrow is I'll go through the derivations, but please make sure you bring a copy of this to the class and I'll post this on the website. Later.